so what i thought was uh, let's let's watch uh, you know a uh, few more videos when faced with an uh, you know ethical issue how do we even make a decision you know although you know we tend to make decisions many a times you know uh, just based on the uh, this thing you know whatever we feel appropriate at that moment but there is there is uh, you know after uh, you know several uh, debates discussion people have found that there are about six or seven steps in making an ethical decision you know depends on you know uh, which theory you subscribe to some people talk about six steps in making ethical decisions some people talk about seven some people talk about nine and the number keeps changing but i think Uh, the minimum number that i saw was uh, like six steps so in in uh, today's class and in subsequent classes you know we are going to move beyond these theories and we are going to start looking at the practical world you know uh, in one of the lectures i said academic world is you know very very different from getting into the real world as long as you are in school colleges you know uh, or universities your uh, the focus of the uh, students is primarily uh, you know uh, to engage themselves with the uh, course curriculum and you know maybe some extra curricular activities and all that but once you graduate and you step into the real world the challenges are going to be very different right uh, so so uh, you know as we said in the orientation you know this course on professional ethics actually you know prepares uh, in some way uh, you know uh, what the uh, real world is going to be okay? for all said and done for all the trainings that you get here for all the discussions that we do nothing is going to prepare you for the real world uh, until until you experience a situation right where you can draw on all these things yet you may still be you know thinking did i do that right or could i have done it a little differently invariably invariably you know experiences are going to count and each individual's experience is going to be as i said individual right it is if it is manaswini's experience it is going to be her experience if it is adish's experience it is going to be his experience you know each one in any given situation will experience certain things that are going to be unique to them and then at some point you are going to draw from those experiences and all you can do is to do each time you know little better than what you did last time and so it is it is a continuous uh, process okay uh, so what i thought in today's class we will look at you know challenges in ethical decision making Uh, and then you know uh, as you run into workplace you know if you continue in academics it is good but if you were to uh, you know land in a job tomorrow or if you are going to be an entrepreneur and you are going to be creating jobs for people the challenges are going to be different so let's let's quickly look at some of the issues that could be confronting uh, you know uh, the workplace and what are the, the topics that we will be covering in subsequent uh, you know modules let me share my uh, screen i had three uh, i saw three interesting videos okay so this is okay um, is the is the screen visible yes sir okay call her here yet does it look like she's here so this is on you know the role of ethics okay let's call her here yet does it look like she's here oh good she can't get on me for being late so is there going to be a lunch at this thing it's 9:30 brunch then So what is this meeting all about anyway? It's something about ethics training. Oh, that sounds like fun. You know, I read that ethics doesn't even really have a working definition. It's all created by the media. That's not even close to being true. Hey, you know how they serve breakfast for dinner? How come they don't do dinner for breakfast? Hey everyone, ready to get started? 
I think we should have Chinese food. Yeah. Look, Carla, we've talked it over, and um, we think this whole ethics training thing is a big waste of time. Yeah, well, we're pretty much on point with everything. Really? On point? What about expense reporting? Mercedes, you turned in a receipt for a place called Salon Rouge. I had a lunch meeting with a client on a bad hair day. How bad was your hair? Like 80s metal band? Bad. Yeah, that works. What about ethical use of social media? So you think that last little bit there is too much? <laughs> this is legal now? Yeah. Well, what legal does not know won't hurt him. The audio is kind of uh, very low. What about conflicts of interest? We've been shopping for distributors who won't charge us too much. Funds are, well, bad. Why? My cousin is really high up in distribution. Man, if I could strike a major purchasing deal with the family's golden child, I promise I can get us a really good deal. And that's just the tip of what we'll cover. There's antitrust, bribes and kickbacks, disclosing confidential information, conflicts of interest, dealing with expense reports, providing gifts and entertainment, harassment, insider trading, falsifying company documents, misuse of company assets, records and information management, responsible communication, retaliation and speaking up, safety, revenue recognition of sales, social media, and third-party risk. Sounds fun, right? Shall we? Okay, so uh, getting into the real world, okay, whether uh, whether you are, uh, you know, um, an employee or whether you are an employer has a lot of challenges, you know. Um, so when, when you know, remember the last time when we talked about, in the last class only we talked about a situation, uh, suppose, suppose, you know, each of you, uh, turns out to be an entrepreneur and you have about 100 employees, right? Uh, but the situation is so bad that, you know, uh, after, uh, you know, uh, several months, probably uh, more than a year of this, uh, you know, lockdown-like situation, uh, things have not improved much. And then, you know, you are faced with an ethical decision that you have 100 employees, but you can only pay 50 employees, right? You have 100 employees. Each of you have 100 employees. Of which you can only pay 50 employees, right? How would you go about uh, the situation? You know, many people can decide that you know this uh, uh, remaining 50 employees could be fired and retain only the other uh, the 50 employees that are needed. Or you could do one thing. You know, looking at the you know the situation. You could probably pay them less and make sure that all the employees are, uh, you know, uh, employed. Okay, so this is uh, this this is not something unusual. You know, this has happened uh, many a times, uh, especially in the corporate world. Okay, uh, corporate world is is a mix of uh, people who are realistic, people who are uh, greedy, and people who are somewhere in between. Okay. So many a times people at the top have sacrificed uh, and, uh, you know, people have been employed for a long time. But at the same time, people down the line, uh, they may or may not even understand the sacrifices that are being made. And, you know, they kind of uh, end up when they make up a mockery of things. And then eventually the management may have to decide to terminate or at least you know put them on uh, notice right so these are these are uh, you know very very tough situations right uh, let's let's quickly look at uh, you know how do we even make about uh, go about making ethical decisions as i said there are lots of theories some people talk about six steps some people talk about seven steps some people talk about nine steps but this uh, short video will tell us, uh, you know, how they go about making a ethical uh, decision. Okay, so before this, any uh, volunteers, what would you do if you are faced with a situation like that?
Good day and welcome to the. Any volunteers? Am I audible in the first place? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay. So think about it. Maybe we'll have a uh, we will view this and then we'll come back to that question. This day's lecture, we're going to ask and answer a very important question, which I think all of us should be asking ourselves. And the question is, how do we decide? At the end of this lecture, I'm going to see if, in fact, you have learned the method for decision making, and Hopefully, your teacher will pick it up with some exercises that will test your ability to make that decision. So let's immediately start with this very important story, which unfortunately some of you may have experienced. So please read the story, and after you've read it, just think of your answer to the question, what should I do? So this this situation, you know, is uh, not very uh, something that we are custom, uh, you know, accustomed to. But but you know, uh, just just extrapolate. It could it need not be you know your father. It could be some other relative. Okay. So, kung babasahin niyo yung kwento, sa totoo, mahirap, di ba? Mahal niyo tatay niyo, mahal niyo nanay niyo, sino ngayon ang pipiliin niyo, ano ngayon ang gagawin niyo? Ang tawag dito, sa filosofiya, ay dilemma. Okay. So, before we can even figure out how we should handle dilemmas, it's very, very important that we understand exactly what a dilemma is. I know many of you are probably thinking it's very easy, but you will be surprised with the discovery that many of you actually phrase or articulate a dilemma in a wrong way. And that's what we come up with decisions that are not always correct. Okay. So what is a dilemma? Very quickly, a dilemma happens because good and evil are not apparent. If it is apparent, then hindi kayo mababagabag, di ba? Kaya kayo nababagabag kasi hindi halata kung ano yung mabuti at ano yung masama. Okay. So, dilemmas are not really about good and evil or good or, or evil, but it is about competing values. So that if you choose one value, chances are you will sacrifice the other. And this is what makes it confounding. Kasi lahat ng halaga nagsasabay-sabay. Pagkatapos, hindi lang nagsasabay-sabay, katasan yung mga halaga na yon importante sa taong nababagabag. Okay. Or, if you want to put it another way, if you notice, I asked the question, what should I do? I did not say, should I tell my mother? Why not? Okay. Because, in fact, should I tell my mother is not a dilemma, it is a solution. And when you have an ethical problem, you have competing values, competing issues. But what is the tendency of the normal human being? The tendency is, when you have a problem, you immediately phrase it in terms of competing solutions. Should I tell my mother or should I keep quiet? And so immediately you're caught in a bind and you don't know exactly what you will do. Let's try to explore this some more. Okay? If a dilemma is a set of competing values, okay, and not competing options, it means that the value should articulate, should be articulated first. Why should they be articulated first? Because the truth of the matter is that values and issues are the reasons for your actions. And so, strictly speaking, you do not, in fact, choose an action. You, in fact, choose 
a value. So we have to ask ourselves, bakit ba ako mababag, nababagabag? Ano ba yung mga bagay na hindi ko naiintindihan at nagbabanggaan? Once you articulate this, I think you've won half of your ethical battle. Okay? So there may be more options and courses of action once you clarify your ethical values. Okay? So paano nga ba magdesisyon? Kadalasan, at nakikita ko sa marami kong naturuan, sa maraming dekada, kasama na yung mga ibang tao na nagtuturo na ngayon, ay mabilisan at ang tinatawag nila sa English, instinctive. Lalo na pag matanda ka na, katulad ng ibang tao, ang isip nyo, been there, done that. Okay? So, mabilisan. So, what's wrong with that? There's really, strictly speaking, nothing wrong with feelings. But feelings are always loaded. They're very, very, very biased. And unless we use reason, we will not see the full sum no, of the dilemma. That's why we always say that ethical decision making is, in fact, a reason process. So, okay, what is a reason process? And why a reason process? Reason process because once you use reason, you will realize that there are so many elements involved in decision making. The first one, of course, are facts. I'm sure all of us have been in a very emotional situation involving people who are very important for us. And what is our tendency? Our tendency is not to look at facts, but in fact to listen only to people who we want to listen to. And that's normal. So with a reason process, you will look at facts and then you will evaluate and look around you and say to yourself, sino bang tatamaan dito? Sino bang naapektuhan? And then you look at what are the values? What are the principles involved? And then note that the options is only one of the five elements in this particular process. And then finally, we will look at consequences. And consequences means different people will be affected differently. I know at this point, this is all very conceptual, but as we go along here and using the example of your father and your mother, it will become clearer to you exactly why these five elements come into play and why you should pay attention to them. Okay. So I have a proposal. My proposal is once you are caught in an ethical dilemma, especially the more emotionally involved you are, take pause. I always say to people who ask me, what's the first step in ethical decision making? I always say, stop, look, and listen. And in fact, this proposal is simply giving you the steps to stop, look, and listen. So here you go. These are your steps. Number one, gather the facts. Number two, who are the stakeholders? Number three, articulate the dilemma as clearly as you can. And then number four, list the alternatives. Number five, compare the alternatives with the principles you've identified in the dilemma. Number six, you weigh the consequences. And then finally, you make the decision. Okay. So let's look at gather the facts. Just very quickly, I love this word because this word, in fact, resonates with how you feel. Merong bumabagabag. Okay. Ang taong nababagabag, hindi mapakali. Hindi niya, sa English, sinasabi natin, I can't quite put my finger into it. And when you're in that situation, the first thing you do is not to pass judgment on people, which we always do. The first thing you do is to gather data. You have to be patiently gathering data. I've taught many medical students these steps, but the problem is they're very thorough when it comes to medical data. But when it comes to ethical problems, then they shortcut the process. It's human nature. Okay, so the first step is gather the data. There are two very important questions to ask. The first question is, what do I already know? But the second question is, once I've stopped and I've begun to listen, I must ask myself, what do I need to know? But I don't know yet. And so like any good researcher, you will have to get out there and find out for yourself what are the things I need to know? So it's very important that you ask yourselves the question. For me to be able to have a capture of this particular dilemma, these are the things, these are the questions that are bothering me, but I don't have the answer for them. So two questions, once again, what do we know? What do we need to know? The second step is very important, and these are who are the stakeholders. Who are stakeholders? You know? In a dilemma, you always have several people involved. Now, what's the 
problem with many of us. The problem, I think, with many of us is we only see the stakeholder who is very dear to us or immediately there for us. We do not, in fact, capture or we miss the stakeholders who I call the abstract stakeholders. Example, if I'm president of the Philippines, my natural tendency is to be very, very you know, caring you know, and to be very, very nurturing of the people who are close to me. But there's a problem here. The president of the Philippines has to take care of about 105 million Filipinos. And for many of them, 105 million Filipinos is just a number. You cannot say, for instance, if you're the spokesperson, that that's okay, only 2,000 have died. This 2,000 is abstract to you, but these are human beings who have families. So it's very important that when you ask yourself who are the stakeholders, you do not only look at stakeholders who are immediately in front of you, but you have to figure out who are your abstract stakeholders. They all have you know, a valid and strong position in your case. Secondly, Okay. You have to figure out who are the primary and secondary stakeholders, because the primary stakeholders are the ones who will be directly hit. The secondary stakeholders may not be as directly hit. The second question there is, the third question, I'm sorry, is what are their stakes and what interests are they protecting? So once again, who are affected? What are their interests? I suggest you use this table. It makes it easier for you to analyze. Who are the stakeholders and what are the interests that they are protecting? And third, the most important, remember this is what I said about dilemmas, competing values, competing issues, not conflicting options. Okay? So you articulate the dilemma, you make a dilemma statement, and this is how a dilemma statement should look like. You articulate it in a statement like this, which you are now seeing in your screen. So if you look at, you know, this dilemma statement, if we now use our example of the father's infidelity, this is the way it looks like. What are the values and the issues involved? Number one, respecting my father's privacy. Number two, I do want to preserve the peace and harmony in the family. Once I tell my mother, there will be problems. So that is very important. But fidelity in marriage is also very important to me. Upholding the truth is also very important to me. So please take note. I just want you to realize that these are not actions. These are competing issues. And if you really take time to think about a dilemma when it happens to you, all of these things will come if only you give it time. So now that I have my dilemma, what do I do next? This is the time now to talk about alternatives. We brainstorm as many possible options as we can, and then we eliminate the untenable ones. You will know, malalaman nyo, ano yung doable at hindi doable. Tanggalin na siya kaagad. Okay? Ito lang yung gusto kong ipaalala. Importante nating maintindihan na yung mga solutions na ito ay dapat, you know, they match the values and the principles that we identified in the dilemma. Values and principles you know, are the more important ones, remember, than the options. So, please, you know, there are always two extreme alternatives in a dilemma. Should I tell my mother or should I not tell my mother? But then it's always helpful to think of a third creative option, a middle option as we call it. Just, just a word of warning, perhaps sometimes there is no third option. But as far as you can, do think of a third option. Again, another warning, it's not a compromise, okay? It's not a compromise. It's a creative option in addressing as many values as you can. You want to address as many values as you can. And so I suggest you make this three matrix column to make the task easier. And this is the way the column will look like. On the left will be your alternative. And so if you notice, I listed alternatives there. The two extreme alternatives and one and two, and the third alternative is talk to my father and demand that he confess. But I don't stop there, huh? because if I stop there, that means ang gagawa ng solusyon tatay ko. Kausapin niya nanay ko. Dapat ako ang gumagawa ng solusyon. So I talk to my father, but if he says no, then I will do it. If he does not, that's why sinabi ko, etc. Pag hindi niya kinausap nanay ko, 
ako pa rin. Ako pa rin ang moral agent eh. Hindi tatay ko. So hindi ko pwedeng iwanan yung solusyon na yung tatay ko, kumbinsihin kong kausapin yung nanay ko. That's not a solution. That's passing the buck. Okay? So, the fifth one is now that I have the alternatives, I now compare the alternatives with the values that were in the dilemma. Do not airdrop values from nowhere. I've seen so many students do this. They just airdrop. Tapos sasabihin ko dun sa comment ko, saan ang gagaling to? No? In fact, the second column is a reflection of the values articulated in your dilemma. So if you create a matrix where the values are ma match with the options, it becomes clear to you that choices have values attached to them. So let's look at it in terms of the matrix. This is the matrix. I tell my mother what will be the values that I am supporting. Fidelity in marriage, right to truth. You know? If I keep quiet, these are the values that will be supported. And then the third, I challenge you now, while you are there, seated in front of your computer, think about the value and the principles that the third one will address. <coughs> so we now have step five. And so finally, we have step six. We now have weigh the consequences. The third column in the matrix should articulate the consequences for each of the alternatives, especially the primary stakeholder. You must consider both negative and positive. So let's matrix it now. So here we are. Okay. For the mother, there will be a consequence. For the father, there will be a consequence. The children, there will be a consequence. So plus means positive, negative means negative. I want you please to be patient with this one. Many students get lazy with this one. Why is this so important? Because you realize by sitting down and really figuring it out that many of your options will have detrimental effects to many people. So list them as patiently as you can. So I listed this down for you. And then again, for number three, I suggest there, this is yours. You figure out while well, so you're seated in front of your computer, what will be the consequences for the third option? So finally, we've come to the end of it. We now make a decision. There is no painless decision. As the Nike commercial says it, we just do it. Now, it's important that we do it by constantly referring to the matrix. Because in fact, when somebody challenges you later on why you made a decision, it will be easy for you to do what in ethics we call justification, which is, by the way, different from rationalization. Rationalization is an instinctive decision, and then you rationalize it. Justification is a reason process. You have a reason process, you make the decision, and then you justify it. What do you use for your proof? Aha, I have my matrix. That's my proof. Okay. So, and here, I always say this. Many books don't put this, but I say it. I teach this to business people as well. And I always say it's important to strategize. Bakit? Kasi yung iba, masyadong goody-goody two shoes. Yung kanilang solusyon, ang ganda-ganda, pero hindi naman nila kayang i-execute. So parang sinasabi ko, patunayan nyo nga sa akin na kaya nyo gagawin to. Ilabas ninyo yung steps for execution. So strategize. So, once again, I propose to you the steps, and these are your steps. What are the facts? What are the stakeholders? What is the dilemma? What are the options? What are the principles involved? What are the consequences? What is the decision? Strategize. So I hope from now on, you will practice using it. You cannot do it on every little decision you will make. Please do it only on the major decisions that you will make. And please be patient. Remember the three-week rule, if you want to develop a habit, you have to do it for three weeks. Be patient with yourself. Eventually, it will become second nature. So this is the conclusion and, in a way, a word of warning for you about this process that I have just taught. It seems like a beautiful process, which can make us clearer thinkers and more decisive decision makers. But, okay. While the decision-making process, which we just went through, slows us down and teaches us to be rational, I just wanted to tell you that in the end, being ethical is about character. In other words, it's not enough for you to go through a reason process. In the end, ang tanong doon, kaya niyo bang gawin? Hindi ba kayo matatakot sa sabihin ng tao? Hindi ba kayo matatakot sa pwedeng mangyari sa inyo kung gagawin niyo talaga yung decision na yon? Sa etika, merong isa pang importanting faculty.
And this faculty is the faculty of the will. The will makes you carry out a decision. And here you go, this is about courage. But your fellow teacher, your ethics teacher, cannot teach you courage. I can only teach you moral decision making, a reason process. In the end, this is about who we really are. And I'd like to end this lecture by quoting Aristotle, one of my favorite philosophers. In the end, we are what we repeatedly do. Ethics is character. And you build that character by patiently pounding and doing this moral reasoning process. Thank you very much, and I hope that helped you. All right. So was that uh, useful? She listed out some steps, basically. You know? And so given given uh, the kind of uh, points that she discussed, you know, let's come back to our case. You know, suppose you you are the owner of a company, you know, and you have excess labor, right? You have two choices that uh, either you can fire the excess labor or you could, uh, you know, pay them less so that you can still employ all of them, right? So we come back to our, our own, uh, back to our question. So what are the choices? How would you go about doing it? You know, if, if you remember the last uh, slide uh, that she said, you know, she said in the end, your ethics teacher cannot uh, teach ethics to you. You know, it is your own courage. It is your own uh, will that is going to uh, make this uh, process unique, right? Okay, so I, I open up the uh, this thing, discussion points. It is for you guys to decide now. Any, any volunteers? Okay, very good. <laughs> so, Sam. Yes, Sam. Uh, so, so, I think I'll go the third option because mm. I'll first talk with my father and mm. I'll obviously ask instead of uh, asking. Sam, me, let's not talk about uh, this okay. mother case, this thing, because no, that was just a case, you know. Uh, for showing how to make decision. I'm I'm saying you are now owner of a company and you have about 100 employees, you know, of which you can pay only 50 because you are, uh, you know, uh, you're running short of cash. Nobody is helping you out. You now have 50 people whom you can pay uh, the regular uh, salary or you can, uh, you know, pay them half and so that you don't need to fire the 100 people, right? And uh, so the choices are like that. So what would you do in those in those kind of situations? So uh, I'll pay them half and uh. like when the company's back to uh, profit, then I'll pay the rest of the money. And obviously to uh, like those who wants, want to work in that uh, money mm. and like mm. half the salary they can and those who mm. don't, they can leave. Mm. Okay. Okay. So you would. Um, so you, you have to think of these, you know, different stakeholders. We may think of only, you know, these fifty people as numbers. Remember when this um, 
the YouTube uh, video when she was presenting. She said uh, if she is the uh, president of Philippines, you know, she is a Filipino, right? So you could hear her speaking not only in Filipino as fluently as in English. Uh, when when you become at that uh, this thing, you know, you are not looking only at 50 people. You are looking at their families. You know, you are probably looking at their you know immediate families, which means you know um, if they are married, maybe their wives and kids and their parents, or if they are not married, even then you know their parents, uh, their sisters, brothers, and all that, right? So you are looking at a why this 50 is it's not a, this thing, you know, so you need to think on a uh, on a different scale altogether, right? So having said that, you know, when you say that uh, you will uh, pay them half and you will not fire anybody, you may run into legal issues because each and every uh, state has a minimal uh, wage rule, you know, which we will probably cover in one of the uh, modules. So, so each each uh, this thing has a labor rule. Labor rule says that uh, for this kind of a person, for this kind of a job, this is the minimum that you can pay, right? So we need to be uh, careful. So how do how do we even engage employees, right? You know, suppose uh, out of this fifty, as uh, Sam, as you said, you will pay them half. Suppose some some say. 20 people out of the 50 say, no, we want our full wage. What would you do? Uh, sir, I'd fire them. Huh? I'll fire them. <laughs> That's a good question. Suppose, suppose out of these 20, you need all these 20 because these are the guys who are involved in production. They're, they're making the product. And they're saying, I, we, we are the ones who are making the product, so we should be paid in full. So you can't fire them. What would you do? The others are only. Yeah, I think I'll only have to huh. cut huh. Uh, other necessities, uh, uh -huh. like to manage the money, like okay. the reduce the security, like so that I have money to give them. Because if these twenty people are important for the company to grow. There is no point in uh, like firing them because then the company won't grow anyway. Yes, yes. So I'll ready. So, uh, so any any concern, any uh, company, for example, when we talk about production, you know, it is not only production. For example, uh, let's say if it's a college or a school, teachers become the uh, you know production managers. They are the ones who are valuable assets, right? In a in a pharma company or in a in a vaccine manufacturing company, it is the uh, scientists and the people who are actually making the vaccine or the drugs. They are the ones who are involved in the production. But then can production alone be enough? Probably not. You need to have people who can, uh, you know, take it to the market, talk to the doctors, you know. So the skill sets are very, very different. So each company uh, definitely has, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, rules which say we need to have these many people in the production unit, these many people in the sales, these many people in administration, these many people and other uh, these things, you know. So uh, there, there are, you know, not a set rule, I would say, but you know, each company based on their need, you know, they are, they will be flexible. They will be flexible, right? So uh, how else can we do this? Anybody else? Uh, Sam said that initially he would fire, and then when we realized that these the, these people are the ones who are actually important for the entire production, he said he will cut down. But then again, you know, we are not in the cutting down business, right? We want to keep all the employees safe uh, or at least, uh, you know, pay them, uh, even though they may not be very happy. But at least, you know, we are going to be, uh, you know, uh, making sure that all the hundred are employed. Any any other alternative? Anybody else has any other alternative? Sir, we can, uh, you know, uh, notice them uh, like the company is going, uh, will, go, will be going through a selection process where. Uh... Shakti, you have muted yourself. <laughs> no, huh. sir, someone muted me. Yes, sir. So, uh, yes, sir, I was saying that uh, maybe we can uh, give them a prior notice that company will be going through a selection process where it will be selecting um, the most. Uh, good ones and uh, maybe they can start looking for a uh, backup jobs 
Mm-hmm. Okay, good, good. So how 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 much time would you give them then? Uh, that depends, sir. Maybe like one or two months. Hmm. Okay. 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 Good. Good. Any other any other uh, uh, thoughts? Anybody uh, else? So, yeah. So I think I can also take a loan, keeping the company as a collateral, like the area, uh, and. Obviously, if there is no profit even after like paying them the money, mm. then the mm. company has to shut down, so that mm. land mm. could mm. go as a collateral to the bank. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. else, I have the I like if there is a profit, then I can repay the bank. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, good, good. Okay, anybody else? Okay, let's 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 look at this scenario. You know, you as the owner of the company, you know, you tell the problem to all the hundred employees, okay, and tell them that uh, boss, you decide. I will, uh, you know, uh, I want to keep maximum people's, uh, you know, happy, okay, uh, but you know, you can decide among the employees whether you want to have all the hundred people. And uh, pay for a less salary, or would you like to fire your 50 uh, colleagues, and you want to be happy alone? How 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 would that choice uh, look to you? You are basically uh, giving the option to the employees themselves. What do you think? Uh, sir, as an employee, both the uh, decision would be uh, unfavorable to me, cause mm. there would be a salary cut on one side, and on the mm. other side there would be uh, stress, and cause obviously mm. with half the workers I have to do more work, mm. and even then, then my full pay w- wouldn't be enough if if I do the double if I do double the work. So <laughs> I'm not sure to which. No, no, sir. What I'm saying is, give the option back to you. You are the owner. Right. Oh. You are the owner, and you are giving the option to the employees, saying you decide among uh, yourself whether you want 50 people to be fired or all of you can work together, and uh, you know you may have less salary. That that's only uh, this thing. How would you deal with that? Um, sir, may I answer? Yeah, yeah, please. um so uh, this is just my opinion but um i feel like that would not be the best idea because um leaving it to you know the employees nobody is going to come up and say oh i'll uh, you know give up my job and so that you know 50 other people can get paid right so it can rise to it can lead to a lot of conflict because at the end of the day people will be looking at themselves which is natural it's they're not going to always think about the company as a whole right because for them at the end of the day is they have to put food on the table and um this option where it's completely you know in their hands it won't be you know exactly like 50 will say okay i'll stay in the company and 50 will say okay i leave and look for other work because that's a completely unknown decision so in my opinion that particular um uh, you know idea wouldn't be the best option i would still go with what sam said where uh, everybody is still employed but there is a slight cut down on salary and then once the company goes into profits you can uh, you know they can be uh, they can be given bonuses or raises or anything like that okay okay very good very good so you know although we say that uh, you know um, in in a, any uh, situation like this you know we we think that 50 50 is what uh, uh, could happen but you know invariably uh, there are few people who are already you know, knowing the situation of the company they are already probably looking out for alternatives and some of them may have lined up alternatives okay the second uh, possibility is that out of these uh, you know 50 20 of them may be the ones who are actually uh, responsible for making a product say for example and so you they they may uh, they may be very unhappy actually they may not express to you but they may be unhappy that uh, salary is being cut you know many a times many a times it happens in the company that you know uh, the people in the management versus the people who are actually working down in the factories you know 
there is a lot of uh, what should i say you know a lot of um, um, bad uh, vibes okay uh, because the uh, management thinks that we are driving the process we have put the money and so we are entitled to you know uh, this much money the person who is actually working on the ground he thinks that i am doing all the hard work you know and i'm getting paid uh, so less right and then you have people in between who are neither in the management nor with the worker who are middle managers you know we are who are also totally unhappy because they can't see you know uh, which way to go right so many a times many a times it typically happens that you know a workplace uh, for all said and done in in many instances you know uh it's it's not a very very uh, what should i say uh, very very happy situation you know all said and done uh, people are people and every time you know uh, something or the other will trigger uh, you know an unwanted reaction you know they will compare themselves to others you know many many different things so you know companies and organizations spend a lot of uh, you know money and time in keeping employees happy in different ways you know and making sure that you know uh, there will be no um, cut in the uh, numbers unless they are forced to do unless they are forced to do you know uh, beyond uh, the circumstances when they are not able to support then you know an entire unit may be closed down this this happens typically uh, in many western world you know uh, they will shut down an entire unit and they may uh, you know um, give you only a month salary but each country has its own labor laws okay and that is why when a multinational company uh, tries to set up a company in india they run into many different kinds of problems because their values and their uh, this thing ethics may not allow them to do certain things in the uh, you know um, indian subcontinent but then they have to follow the la- labor rules here so you know they have they have unique challenges when a multinational company sets up a shop in india or when an indian company goes and sets, sets up a shop something like infosys wipro tcs you know when all these people have uh, their offices in other places it doesn't matter whether it's an indian mnc or you know uh, as foreign mnc there are lots of challenges you know when we uh, suppose to tomorrow you know uh, you being the owner you set up a uh, you know another concern in a totally different country it could be united states could be europe could be japan you had to follow their labor laws you know and their labor law, laws and our labor laws could be totally uh, you know opposite extremely opposite uh, in different things right so you need to have some way to reconcile this so there are challenges okay which we will probably uh, discuss in our subsequent classes all right so we'll take this up in the next class all right okay any any questions any thoughts okay you know, good sir. good i'm happy that a uh, few people are uh, continuing to discuss this thing thank you so much okay so we'll meet in our next class then all right thank you thank you sir